All right. You may remember this particular problem from the other day. We did this one by hand. But you can actually use the shortcut that you've already learned. You've already learned the shortcut for this, but not in its current form. You will find that a lot of Chapter 5 from Algebra 2 is going to come back to be hugely helpful. That was the chapter that took us about, I don't know, a month and a half, two months to get done. Chapter 5 in Algebra 2. So, because you get to rewrite things. And as long as you rewrite things legally, then it's fine. How do you get to rewrite the square root of x? What about 1 half? x to the 1 half power is correct. Because remember, there is an understood 1 there. And where's the 2 come from? Up on the root, correct? So do you agree, really, that is saying x to the 1 half? For those of you that have forgotten and would like another example, if we have, say, the fifth root of x to the second, how could you rewrite that if you felt like it? x to the 2 fifths, right? Now, which one's easier to take the derivative of? Well, we already did that one by the definition. Remember when we had to do conjugate and all that weird stuff? It took us forever, right? But now we're to the point where we can use the power rule. What number is understood to be out front? A 1. So what you're going to do is take that power times what's out front. So 1 half times 1 is 1 half. X. Now what are you supposed to do with that exponent? You're supposed to subtract how much? Okay, so really here it's harder to subtract 1, right? But you can still subtract. You could look at it this way that it's 1 half minus which form of 1 is going to be the most helpful? 2 over 2, correct? That's 1, right? And so we're looking at basically negative half. Did everybody see where that came from? If you subtract 1, right? So it is negative half. Agreed? Now when rewriting this, you have to be a little bit careful as well. Because again, I, I would prefer that you do rewrite them. The 1 is in the numerator, agreed? This one's sitting right there. And that 2 is already in the denominator, agreed? And do either one of those want to get moved? You know, what wants to get moved is that. And by the way I wrote this, it's hard to tell where is that x right now. Is it technically the numerator or denominator? By the way I wrote it, it's hard to see, but it's technically in the, it's in the numerator. Okay? By the way I wrote it, because it's 1 half times that. Okay? And so the 1's on top. 2 is on the bottom, so where does that x to the 1 half really want to go? See, it's got a negative power. It would really go down here, and you could rewrite it that way, correct? Now, in Algebra 2, you were told that was no good because there's a radical in the denominator. It doesn't matter. It's calculus. It doesn't matter. In fact, we're going to leave it down there because we're going to prefer it be down there. And there it is. Well, that took a whole lot less time to get the exact same answer we got what, about a week ago. Yes? Uh, you could leave it written as x to the 1 half on the bottom, but for what you're going to use it for, you might want to see the square root back in there. Uh, I think that, that'll be a decision that you'll have to make as we go on, but I think you'll choose to write it back as a radical. I could be wrong. So that's how you can deal with radicals. Whoa, that's a fun one. Just imagine, though, doing that one by the definition. Taking x plus delta x, squaring it, then taking the cube root of it, and then taking it times 2, and then subtracting this function, and then dividing it all by delta x. And then taking the limit as delta x went to 0. That would be spectacular. So why don't you take a second and see if you can just rewrite it for me. Can you get it to a form that we can use power rule? Is really what I'm looking for. Okay. And what I'm trying to find out is, do you know which pieces go with what? What goes with the x? What stays in the numerator? What goes in the denominator? What, where does everything go so that you can rewrite it? <laughs> kind of based on the rules we've been using and the stuff you learned in Algebra 2. Right. With that amount of time, does anybody believe they have rewritten this one to the point where we can use power rule? Yes. What I've been told is one half x to the negative two thirds. I'm agreeing with that because here's a one. The two is already on the bottom. Agreed. You could rewrite this portion as x to the 
just two thirds is down there, right? But is this now to the point that I can use power rule yet, though? No, I've got a numerator, denominator. You want to do that? Okay, there's another rule I could use, but let's let's save that for a little bit later because this power rule is way quicker on this type. And so what you're going to do is you're going to move this portion of it, and you're going to make it unhappy. Why don't I move the two? Because you're going to have a two to the negative one power, and that's just kind of weird, all right? And so just leave the two in the denominator. There it is right there. It hasn't moved, all right? And now, once again, it's when it's written like this, now that x is kind of understood to be in the numerator, right? So now that we've rewritten it, now we can go ahead and say, all right, I can use power rule now. So you take negative 2 thirds times 1 half. And if you need to do that off to the side, there's nothing wrong with that. I, would, I guess I would prefer you didn't use a calculator on this particular one. but Okay, negative 2 thirds times 1 half, right? The 2's cancel and become 1's, right? So you go multiply across, you got negative 1 on the numerator and... Three, so negative one third. Is that the is that the new exponent or what is that negative one third? What is that? The new, the, yeah, the new number in front, which is the <laughs> not constant, another C word. Coefficient. Coefficient. Yeah. And now you write down the variable x. Now this is an interesting one. I have to take this exponent here and I've got to move it down one. Yeah, I have to subtract one. And so really it's negative two thirds minus well what form of one are we gonna use? Three thirds, right? And so we're talking about negative five-thirds, okay? Any uh, disagreements with the negative five-thirds or the negative one-third? No? Okay, now as far as what you do with that, well, right, let's, see, let's see what we got here. Well, we know we got a negative and we got a three. Now when I move this back to where it would like to be, do you agree there'll be a radical involved? I hope so. X. Five, three. Now, as far as simplifying that further, you, you could, because the number on the inside is bigger than the one on the outside, so some of them can get out. If you remember that from um, Algebra 2. Uh, so another way that you could write this one, wow, that's the worst prime ever. There we go. For those that want to see it, you could write it as the cube root of x to the third times the cube root of x squared. You see how that's x to the fifth if you do it that way? Then this cancels, so an x gets out, and you're left with that. For those that want to, there's not necessarily a huge need to do that. Okay, This is probably, would be considered by most, most college professors as the simplified version of the answer. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, this is good. Any questions on that Algebra 2 maneuver there? I took out the one I could, and I left the other one in. The other one was stuck. And you can always do that when the inside number, the exponent on the inside is bigger than the root. You can always get some of them out. Sometimes all of them. For example, if that was x to the sixth in there and a three, then we'd get them all out. Okay. So any questions as far as radicals are involved? All right. Well, so far, do you agree we've kind of just had one term that we had to take the derivative of at a time? This one little term plus another term, and we could take the derivative of that one separately, plus some other term, we could take the derivative of that separately. Well, what if things are multiplied? Now, as you take a look at this very first example, obviously we could FOIL it and then take the derivative. That does work. Okay. But for what we're going to need product rule for later, you might want to learn it. Okay. It's pretty big. Now, some people like all the F's and G's and all of that stuff. And again, you're going to want to start getting really good at reading that stuff. Because you agree F of G just means there's some function there, right? G of X means there's another function. And you're trying to do what to them? If you look right here in the beginning, you're trying to... Yeah, you did learn this too, yeah. We're trying to, what's this little here? It's a dot, multiply. And then this is saying take the derivative. Very good. That's all it's saying, right? Very good. And so over here, it's saying, all right. What's it saying to do right there? Which is just the function. Don't do anything to it, right? And then take it times the derivative of g, right? And then, oh, here's product and addition going together again. Remember, product is multiplication. You remember how multiplication and addition seem to be a pretty good pair? They work together a lot. And then what's it saying to do right there? Just write it down, right? And then here it's saying take the 
All right, very good. You're getting a little bit better at reading those things. Now, does it mean anything to you? Well, that's going to be something we're going to have to figure out. Now, what some groups have liked in the past is they write it a little differently. Some have just done it this way. because it shortens it up, uv prime plus vu prime. But the beautiful part is that it's addition, so does it really matter which one you do first? So do you notice how it's basically the derivative of one times the other one, basically in each case? And you're adding them, so it doesn't even matter. All right, But know that you basically have to take one function times the derivative of the other and then flip-flop it, and then you'll be fine. Okay. Uh, the reason that they like to use this is the AP is kind of going towards that notation when they give you stuff, and so that's why I tried to show that to them. Uh, either way, you can look at this first one. Once again, we could FOIL this out and then just take the derivative because it would be independent terms, separate terms. You'd get the same answer. Right? Uh, it might not look the same, but it'd be the same answer, and that's why you always have to watch out for a multiple choice test in calculus. Don't ever say you want one of those. All right. So you could look at this one as being f of x and this one as being g of x, or you could look at this one as being u and that one as being v. It doesn't really matter. All right, Whichever way makes sense to you. I think a lot of people like the u and v because there's less stuff all over the place. right? And so if we're going to take the derivative, and again, you're going to just have to trust me for now because I'll be honest, probably foiling this one, then taking the derivative is quicker on this one. Uh, but for what you're going to need this for, just stick with me. According to this, the one up here, I should just write down f of x. Well, according to me, which one's f of x? Well, that one. So 3x minus 2x squared, right? Again, and these are two functions multiplied together. That's why this is different. That's why it's also called the product rule. And then it says right here in the next step to take the derivative of g. Well, that's something we can do, right? If they just ask me for the derivative of that, that's pretty easy. It's 4, right? Plus now I just got green all over the place, so let's use a different color. Plus, we just got to write down G, right? So you just write it down. Okay. And now we're up to the point where we got to do F prime of X, which means take the derivative of F of X, right? And so what is that? 3 minus 4X, right? And keep in mind, imagine how much fun the definition would be on this one. It's going to be loads. All right. Now, this isn't very well cleaned up, is it? And this is really why product rule takes sometimes a little bit longer than just foiling. But again, you're going to need this. Just trust me. Now, let's clean things up. So what do, you, what do I mean by clean things up? Well, multiply things out. Okay. So right here, this is what? 12x minus 8x squared, right? Any questions on how the green turned into that black down there? And I'll just go work on the blue. Plus whatever I get when I do all this over here, which is what, 15 minus 20x, at least the way I'm doing it, plus 12x minus 16x squared. Again, any questions how the green and the blue turned into the black? And perhaps I'll write my cleaned up answer out up here because it's getting kind of low on the smart board here. All right, so now that we've got that, what I like to do is we probably want to put this in descending order because that's probably how we're going to look at it. So what's our biggest exponent down here? It's squared, right? And we got one here and there. And so let's put them together, and they're both negative. So we're looking at negative 24x squared, right? Everybody see that? Okay. And then we got some x's. Well, here's a 12. 12, that's 24, right? Minus 20, so we're back to just 4, right? So those are all gone. And then a 50. There it is. There's your derivative. So really, it, it was a little bit more work than foiling and just taking the derivative, but not that bad, right? Okay. And it's really nice when both of the derivatives come out to be constants like this. It just works really fast. All right? Yes? Yes? The beginning of the product rule? Yes, we put basically f of x went right here. Right? Here's g prime of x. 
that was what we were given. This is saying take the derivative of that. And we were given f of x times g of x. So we're trying to take the derivative. No, this is, this is saying f of x times g of x right here. This is that portion. And the directions are telling us to do that portion. And so I just wrote it as f prime of x because that seems like how you guys want to see that. Okay? Yeah, I basically replaced, I replaced all of this with just that because <laughs> I didn't want to write it. Okay? Good question. And the only time you want to use the product rule is when you do have two multiplied together. So questions on the product rule? I know that's a new one, right? It's not that bad. No. As long as you just keep straight whichever way you want to do it. So, well, let's find out. Suppose u and v are functions of x. I'm not going to show them to you, though. I'm not going to tell you what they are. But we do know they are differentiable at x equals 3 and that u of 3. So putting 3 into u, I get 2. Okay? So I know it's differentiable. What's that mean again? I can take a derivative there at x equals 3. This means that if I put 3 into function u, I'm putting 3 in for x or y. X, I get out a 2, right? So in other words, 3 comma 2 is a point in, in u, right? You with me on that? Over here, it's saying u prime of 3 is negative 1. So what does that mean? The derivative, so at 3, notice how I'm sticking with 3 here, though, is what? Well, what does this mean? Well, I'm still in function u, right? So this is the slope, OK? Very good. Notice, again, I'm sticking with 3. V of 3, so this is a x value, right? And this is a y value. This here is an x value still, but this is a slope. It's the slope of V, though. So they don't even have the same slope. That's OK. Let's face it. If you had two graphs, the chances of them having the same slope at the exact same place is kind of, kind of out there. Yeah. All right. So it says the derivative, so it says determine the following derivatives at x equals 3. Okay. Uh, the reason that I added, this is a recent addition to the notes. Uh, the AP loves questions like this. They want to know if you really know product rule. And they're not going to give you the function. Because they figure that if you've gone through a calculus class, you probably can do the derivative by product rule, or in other words, do that. Right? They want to see conceptually, do you understand what the product rule is. Well, if I were to take the derivative of this, do you agree, isn't that what we just did? Write down the first one, right? And then you take the derivative of the second one. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? So it'd be what? V prime, right? And then plus V U prime, right? And what they're telling me to do is basically find, how should I say it? I'm going to be careful with how I write it. They basically want me to substitute 3 in. Okay? Because they want to know add a value of 3. So do I know u of 3? That's what I would put down here. Do I know what that is? It's 2. Do I know v prime of 3? V. V prime of 3 is 4 right here, right? Plus v of 3. U prime of 3. You figure out that answer, and you just figured it out. You basically just figured out the slope of the composition of a function without even seeing either one of them. Truly amazing that you can do that. So you do, what is this, 8 minus 6 is 2. So remember when we did compositions of functions, like f of g of x and all that stuff? Well, that's kind of close. But what you just did is you just multiplied two functions together. Do you agree that would give you a new function? You just found the slope of that function at 3 without ever seeing any of the functions involved. You never saw a thing. Now, what if they would, at the end here, said, exactly, you could not have done this problem. Because they're telling me all the x values of 3. And they told me 2. That's why all your derivatives are with respect to x. So the x value is so important. Because if you don't know enough information about that x value, there's only so much you can do. Okay? That doesn't mean that all your functions have to only have x's in them. All right, Most of them at the beginning will. But it's saying that with respect to some x value, this is what's going to happen. 
Okay. Yes. Question. So, all the experts In this particular instance, yes, because they're saying take u times v, multiply them together, and tell me what's happening at three. And so I needed all that information about three. Now watch out, what I might do sometimes is also throw in like, oh, u of 4 is 7, and u prime of 4 is 2, just to see if you'll use them. All right? But obviously in this problem, are you going to use those? No, because the x value we're worried about is 3. You just found the slope of two functions that got multiplied together that you've never even seen. I don't know. I made up these numbers. They'd probably be pretty cool, though, if they went. What's that? We said to determine the following derivative at x equals 3. So they want to know what's the slope at x equaling 3. Yep. And that's what we found. But we never even saw a thing. So uh, what are we going to do with b, then? What's going on there? We're using the same information. So do we need to use product rule is then the question. How come? Oh, so wait a minute. How come we need to deduce product rule here? Oh, they were multiplied together. Oh. So what do we do here? Well, this is even easier. What's the derivative? Now remember, u is a function. So what's how do you write its derivative? U yeah, how do you write it? U prime. Isn't that how you write the derivative? So if I took three times some function and then I took the derivative, it'd be three times that. Agreed? So this is, the derivative of this is just 3u prime. That's the derivative. I've never seen this function, but I know if I did see it, I could figure out u prime. All right, plus 2. I don't know what v looks like, but if I did see it, I know I'd be able to take the derivative, and it would be called v prime. Right? And do I have that information at least as long as we're talking about x equals 3? I do. Do I need to use all the information I did last time? No. no. U prime is at 3. Negative 1. Negative one. Who can paraphrase what you just did? Close. If on the slope of something. Kind of add a guy. So we found, have, have we seen any functions in this problem at all? Nope. Well, we know there's two of them, u and v. I haven't seen them. But I do know if I took three times u and two times v and took the derivative, I could find the slope at three because of the information given. Again, if I asked you at x equals one, no dice. You're not going to work. And if I gave you extra information, you need to know, in this case, I did give you extra information, correct? There was a bunch of stuff you didn't even need. Okay? So you've never seen, like, the V of 3, you didn't need to know that. U of 3, you didn't need to know that. Okay? So there's some function out there that's doing all sorts of weird things. But the slope there's 5. Okay? And actually, the potential of figuring out u and v, there's just too many options of well, functions that could be u and v. All right. And for tomorrow, what you need to do, and you can do it on a separate sheet of paper, I don't really care. You can even do it on the assignment. It's, a, it's up to you. Is find if y is. Yeah, you can add it right to your assignment if you want. Or if you prefer to sneak it on your notes, whatever you want to do. I'll look at it tomorrow. So there's Y. What I would like you to do is find Y prime, and I would like you to do it in two different ways. The first way, multiply it out, distribute, and all that good stuff, then take the derivative. Okay, because I told you that was an option, right? Just just multiply it all the way out. Then you got a bunch of separate terms. Just take the derivative of each one. Foil. So, well, it's not foil because it's a trinomial and a binomial. So no, 
distribute. <laughs> All right, the second way is product rule. You should have the same answer for both problems. If you don't, fix it because you're wrong. Any questions? All right, you got some time now to get started. Everybody got it?